God, do we have a lot of refing down here. Hi, Bart. Morning. So, uh, uh, Arsenal this morning? Uh-huh. I see where this We goes. are still top of the league. Don't talk to me about matches played. <laughs> Um, as, as is, as is tradition, uh, I will, I will uh, go ahead and, and let you say what is on your mind because this is a reaction Monday and, uh, but please proceed with your reaction and, and uh, then we will continue with the conversation about other things. Go for it. My reaction after these past two games, cause we're going to lump them together because there are similarities is that if I were a coach needing a contract, either extension or renewal at the end of the season, I'd be trying to win these games um, because losing points at home, especially to direct competition for playoff spots and not just playoff spots, but home playoff spots, which mm-hmm. has been the stated goal mm-hmm. of the current leadership yep. um, is not a good way to get yourself into those home playoff spots. Um, I think it's disappointing that, you can take a lead at home and lose it in two matches in a row and lose it in ways that are both, both of them were very um, just bad periods where you decided to give up multiple goals in your down form within the match. Um, That's the part that really is frustrating because you controlled a lot of both matches and in 10 minutes, <laughs> you see all of your good work evaporate, and then you have to do all the hard work to try to, you know, get back into it. Yep. Um, and we can talk about depth and injuries, but I'm tired of giving excuses to a team that, you know, I'm sorry they are because other teams deal with injuries and depth issues. Um, if, you know, you had a better more pervasive, more understood, and more structurally sound system of play, then I think that these issues might not be as exasperated when you come up against the slightest bit of depth issues or injury replacements or anything. But um, there were some positives. And, you know, I think, again, you're looking at a team that has a very young center back who has playing pretty well. Um, and I think that's been, I know Jared has been on the Noah Cobb train for forever, but, um, you know, I think he definitely, you can see finally, cause I was worried about him last year. Like, I think it's fair to say that he, he struggled in actual Atlanta United matches, but this year he looks very confident, very comfortable. Um, and looks like a guy that as you build for the future, cause you're always building for the future. Um, you can rely on him to be in that mix. Um, Especially again, as you have to look at um, when we have depth issues and he he's been the preferred depth option when your two starting center backs are out. So, you know, again, you are allowed to say, Hey, look, we're struggling a little bit with injuries. We're struggling a little little bit with depth. And those are legitimate things. Um, The the positive is Noah Koff has shown very well. The negative is you've given up, a lot of goals at home recently after we talked about the defense being good, we decided to not be good anymore. Um, So I blame whoever scheduled that tweet uh, because that that was a little bit of commentators curse there. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, but there, I mean, look, the negative is you drop points at home to matches in a row to teams that you need to be beating at home. If you Mm -hmm. want to achieve the goals you claim to want to achieve this year, Mm -hmm. Uh, the positive is you have Noah Cobb who's, despite giving up those goals been pretty good and not really at fault for any of those goals. Um, so, all right. So this would be the, the way that we would present perhaps how our thoughts about Noah Cobb over the last handful of seasons. I don't want to say, I told you so. I don't want to blow our own horn or toot toot. We are still recipients and owners of all the trophies. There you go. So there you go. Not a and, to- and it's fair. Like he's he's just developed. He's got. He was he was good, and you could see like, oh, he's got the skills. But like, can you actually make it count in a game? And now it's like, holy crap! Yeah, he is. So yeah, it's great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. So there's a lot of. Oh boy, there's a lot of reffing down here. Um, and I wanted to get into a, a larger discussion with you about it. 
I agree that Coventry were shafted and Manchester United didn't deserve anything that happened to them. See, uh, <laughs> so you got to say that in 30 when, when Drew comes in. Um, all right. So I want to get into Nottingham Forest and Everton, but I want to get into the larger picture that is attached to that particular match. And uh, NBC, rightfully, they, they went deep dive into the, the idea in and of itself. But it has gotten to the point where now uh, Nottingham Forest has decided they're going to go completely and totally bad guy here. That They, they are you know, basically, th this would have been, the if they were allowed to, to go on the 280 character app and do this, you know. They would have done that. They would have done that over 280 characters. It, but they chose to go complete and total bad guy. And now they are to the point where you have the, a team basically saying that we warned the, uh, the referees organization that the VAR in a match that is basically a point deduction six pointer that could determine possibly you know who gets relegated and who doesn't the team who hired an ex referee to be an advisor apparently on the friday before the match goes to the referees organization the pgmol and says hey look the var in this match is a luton town fan and Luton, for those not following the Premier League, is the first team currently in the relegation zone just kind of peaking up, and there's like a point here or there, and it could determine who goes and who stays in the Premier League. This rival is the VAR. 11.30 Friday morning, this rival is the VAR. It has, a VAR, has this VAR as a fan. Do something about it. PGO, PGMOL does nothing about it. You have Nottingham Forest, and Everton with not one, not two, but three instances that Nottingham Forest claims should have been penalties. I would say the third one of the three is probably the most egregious. I, of I, yeah, I think uh, first off, we'll just start there. I don't think any of the penalties that they wanted were clear cut. Let's just put it that way. But then let me ask you this. Could you have in a universe, in, in, in a universe that is watching these matches, could you have given a penalty for the first yeah. one? Oh, mm. I know you could have given a penalty for the third one. I think the third one we are in agreement, and all three of these, by the way, were involving Ashley Young, which was somewhat ironic. Uh, you had three instances where you had uh, a stomp on Gio Reyna from behind. You had a handball call, and then the third one where – uh, Morgan Gibbs White is taken down from behind, and that third one is the one I think that everybody's focusing on going, yeah, that's a penalty of the three. Could you have given a penalty in the first one? Could you have seen an explanation for one being given in the first one? The second one, I'm kind of like, eh. But in these where, you know, we've seen soft by comparison calls, could you have seen two of these being given of the three, I guess, first and foremost? The answer is yes. I mean, I think if you wanted to give a penalty in some of these situations, you probably could have found a reason to. However, as you just said, uh, they were soft at best. And we've complained about penalties like those being given to basically re-referee um, the matches. And, and I, look, I'm not saying they don't deserve to be upset, right? Like, obviously, they um, Nottingham Forest is in a is in desperation mode because they've been kind of crappy all season, despite you know spending a bajillion dollars. Yeah. So, you know, like I think this is to me, this is way more of the referee being the scapegoat for a team not achieving and performing the way that they would like to. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, yes, you you could see ways in which these could be given penalties. Yeah. Um, but I think really only the third one, I would say, okay, yeah, I can see that being like, maybe that should have been a pen. Um, but let's say maybe 
Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. So like you said, it's a maybe. And so then on the 280 character app after the fact, Nottingham Forest says this on their official Twitter account. So <sighs> you can't just blame the, the, the guy in charge of social media going rogue. This was probably something that Evangelinus Maranakis put together and was like, oh, this was a statement. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this, is a, this is a statement from the club. Three extremely poor decisions, three penalties not given, which we simply cannot accept. We warned the PGMOL that the VAR is a Luton fan before the game, but they didn't change him. Our patience has been tested multiple times. Nottingham Forest Football Club will now consider its options. What in the blue hell is a Premier League team doing at 280 characters, making it sound like this is just completely and totally sour grapes, and you're venting in a league where, yeah, you know you're up against the wall with uh, profit and sustainability and all these different things. So you just decide you're going to go complete and total bad guy here and blame the Referees Association for not reassigning a VAR because the guy is allegedly, apparently, a fan of a rival team that could be relegated. I mean, this is, like, all over the place. Well, and I think the issue that I have with this is taking to Twitter to be so clearly upset about the result of a match, Yeah. right? Um, and and taking it out on the referee crew and blaming the fact that the the VAR might be a Luton fan after I mean I forget the order of the operations in this but Luton had already been trashed what twelve to nothing I think this this weekend or whatever that final actually was yeah five, um, five it was five <laughs> um, I can't remember if it was if that was before or after I really can't sorry but it, the point is let's not pretend like you cannot have yes there are issues there i can understand them wanting to switch it i get it but also there, he's not the only person in charge of video review there are other referees and us video operators involved with this so you have a var a vir um you know on top of the fact that you had four referees on the field um, you know, I think they're, they're again, upset about the result. You still lost by multiple goals. Mm -hmm. So if you're needing questionable penalty calls to get on the scoreboard, if you're needing questionable penalty calls to salvage a season, that's 38 matches long in which you've won. Let me look it up nine. Um, then again, I think the issue comes down to your team is not performing and getting the results that you had thought they were going to get this season. And you're upset at a, you're, you're focusing your anger on a thing and a, and a person that doesn't have as much of control over what you think they have control over. And so then in the, uh, in the telegraph, Clattenburg, who once again was appointed by Nottingham Forest in February as their new referees analyst, says in a column for the four-letter paper. So that should give you enough of a an, your antennae yeah. should be up at the beginning. He writes in a column for the four-letter paper how Forrest felt victimized describing the match being as grim a game as they have encountered since returning to the Premier League. On Atwell's appointment, he adds, certainly I would not have risked this situation if I were the head of referees and all of this could have been avoided had the PGMOL simply made smarter appointments. The PGMOL can acknowledge the errors if they want. The key match incident panel can say Forrest should have been awarded three penalties if they wish. Howard Webb can offer up an explanation on his match officials mic'd up television show with Michael Owen if he's so inclined. All of that is bound to happen, but none of it will help Nottingham Forest. Now Forrest has lodged three complaints this year against the PGMOL. Oh, well, uh, hmm. This is uh, Mark Clattenburg forgetting to be team referee. Yeah. Um, and But, you know, hey, he's getting a paycheck from another team, so I understand why he's... Uh, <laughs> siding with them on this it is a little like it's it's if i'm pgmol if i'm the referee as a whole um i'm not very happy with mr Clattenburg right now who mm -hmm. does seem to be 
He's grabbing a paycheck. I mean, he has completely turned from where I would hope. And, and, and again, as a referee, you should be unbiased as well. And I know you're collecting a paycheck for Nottingham Forest, but you now have to admit your own bias when you're evaluating. I mean, how many times do I come on here and tell you that Philadelphia deserved everything that they got <laughs> and then some? Well, obviously that's because I'm biased, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you you do need to, in your evaluation of referee performances, also need to be unbiased. And I think they're letting their, um, again, their frustration, their anger at the way the season has gone leak into fair and unbiased evaluation of the matches that they're playing. Because again, you're not playing that well. And yeah. to keep blaming that on a referee, because this is not the first time Forrest has done this this year, uh, to keep blaming that on the referees, making them escape goading, uh, making them escape goat is disappointing. Have you or any of your refereeing family i'll go ahead and use that word have any of you or your refereeing family ever been accused of favoritism uh in, you know have reputations sullied impugned anything like that i mean have folks ever come after you or anyone in your referee family for perceived bias or anything like that either leading into a match coming out of a match you know outside of the parents sitting there going ah, you know in a match yeah I mean, not not really because they don't have the background on us that they they have, right? Like, yeah. um, I, I'm <laughs> they can't go look where I played and you know who I support, you know, uh, at the the level I'm refereeing. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe the the most um, that they could see is that I follow the Peachtree uh, FC people on social media and so if i have a referee abby's kids team then um, you know they <laughs> yeah. can say that i'm biased toward them but um i'm sure aaron will g gladly tell you about a time i called a penalty for him or on him um, you so you know i it, they just don't have that that information right like i mean you can you can look up um referee professional referee birthplaces and you know teams of of support um but you can't do that for me. Um, and if you did, it's funny because it's like, I, you know, I referee for multiple, I refereed uh, this weekend for a club that, you know, I don't have any real tie to them. I just, they're, they're the ones giving me a paycheck. And, you know, I also know that they're not the only ones actually paying me. The other team that's playing also paid me because that's how league fees work. So, you know, I, I'm not being... <laughs> There's no incentive for me to give a, a call to one team or the other. Um, and especially when I don't really have, again, any allegiance to these clubs. But, you know, again, people seem to think that there's this thing called home field advantage or home cooking. And then I'm like, I don't really care. Um, the most that I will uh, uh, give is like sometimes, and granted, this works in uh, a lot of times against a club that I referee for is, um, you know, I have one club that I referee for. Their coaches are really awesome. They're usually very nice to me and, um, you know, so I'm not saying they get away with anything on the field, but, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to have an actual conversation with those coaches over a call, as opposed to um, one coach in particular at a club that I referee a lot, who doesn't seem to think that I do anything right. Um, <laughs> yet I don't like anything he does as a coach. So, you know, it's like, well, um, this can go both ways, but, um, but yeah, no, there's not like a, we don't have that at our, uh, at our level. Because they don't, they can't pull up my playing career. Um, it's not on Wikipedia. No, uh, but I, I didn't know, you know, if you had had any kind of of interactions or anything. It's like, man, I some... mean, he, like you said, the, the coach, parents always complain, right? They're gonna say, oh, well, you you clearly like this, or you know, you just hate my child, or some random reason. And I'm like, you know, uh, what are we gonna do about this? You hate my child. Uh, uh, that it, I, honestly, maybe you should have that as a T-shirt that you wear. Yeah. Uh, when you're going to the your your fields yeah. to, to do well, your well, to be honest, some of your kids are little brats, and you know maybe you should parent better. But <laughs> at soccer for you as PODs at Bartim's Prime 19 on the 280 character app. Since he's got his Arsenal mug today, should uh, Max Kilman have been given a red card for his challenge on Kai Havertz? <sighs> I, okay, had it been given a red, I think it would have been really hard to argue that it shouldn't have been, but uh -huh. I think 
I, I was I, I I when I saw it, I was like, oh, that could be a red. But I think ultimately a yellow card is like, oh, like it's OK. Right. Uh, you, you address the problem. Um, I didn't have any real issues with it at the time. Let's put it that way. Because what what I want to do in these situations, in addition to talking about the news associated with a call, is I, I want to kind of go into the, the brain of an official and see if, you know, if we turn the mirror on itself a little bit, could this have gone the other way? If, if absolutely. Kilman, OK, so Kilman could in your mind could have been given a red card. Yes, I think there's legitimate reasons for him um the you know i guess if you want to talk about excessive force and serious foul play um you know possibly meets those i think one of the big things that we always look for is the placement of the actual tackle itself where is it happening on the body or leg you know so a lot of times we see a stud to the knee and you go that's a red card right um so you know where is that imaginary line? I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot of combinations that go into it. But you know, but if if you, um, you know, just happen to graze someone's knee because you're challenging for a ball that's bouncing in the air, then well, no, that's not a red card. But if the ball's on the ground and your your foot goes through someone's thigh, then you know, yes, that's a red card. Uh, in this instance, I think it was it wasn't as high as I thought it needed to be to meet the standard for a red card. And I don't think it was out of the context of not trying to win a ball. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So. It absolutely does. And that's the other thing is, it, it, was there a legitimate play on the ball? Because a lot of times red cards are nowhere close to that. Um, this one, at least there was some guys of trying to play the ball. Two more plays that I want to discuss with you before we get into the new rules of engagement that are finally being activated in Major League Soccer. Which we uh, had a controversy about that on Saturday. So. I'm saying. So, uh Please, if you would, sir, comma, or colon, explain the handball rule as it currently is these days and the latitudes that officials have when saying, yes, it is a handball, no, it is not. So, as we all should know by now, the playable part of the arm begins at basically the armpit. So, anything from the armpit up and into the body, we're fine. Anything below the armpit, not fine. And essentially what this gives us as referees is a nice little boundary that usually aligns about the sleeve, right, to say, okay, yes, this is a handball. This is not. Um, I don't know why they particularly made this change and made the boundary where it is, but that's just where it is. Um, so that's the first, if you will, um, thing we're looking for is mm -hmm. where does it hit yeah obviously the other thing we're looking for is making your body bigger making yourself gaining an advantage basically by making that body bigger uh using the arm um again we do not judge intent because can't always judge intent and have that be consistent across um but we do want to say okay, did they deliberate deliberately touch the ball um, meaning, was there a motion towards the ball, right? Was there a motion out from your body to make yourself bigger? Um, so we still have that unnaturally bigger silhouette, right? And motion involved. Mm -hmm. That's that's really what we're looking for. Um, that said, yeah. we allow some, you know, some movement. We allow some times where the ball might hit someone else and hit you, might deflect off of parts of you or off the field. Like we we are trying to allow the randomness of a spherical object hitting a flat plane at some sort of speed and spin. And the gravity attached. And all the all the all the physical factors. Um you know, and, and yeah, and Alex, you bring up a good point and proximity. You know, if I'm standing a foot from the a, a ball and someone kicks it into my arm, well, did I really have time to react? Um, so there's a lot of things that go into it. And so that doesn't really answer the question very well, right? Um, because there are multiple factors in mm -hmm. this um, and they kind of scale up and down depending on where you are in the field and, and what exactly you're doing. Um, 
but we're definitely looking for motion toward the ball or motion to make yourself bigger. And, and we're still looking at that unnaturally bigger silhouette. So then Jack Grealish in the FA Cup semi against Chelsea, uh, he is jumping up into the air and his arm is about a ball's length yeah. away and the ball hits literally in that gap space right there against his left elbow on its way through, and they decide that that's not. Yeah, I think this was uh, taking into account that when you do jump, you're not jumping like a pencil. Yeah. You know, you are raising your arms. And also, again, with the idea of the, the armpit kind of being allowed um, some leverage or um, some leniency, this space in between your body and your the, the upper part of your arm anyway is oftentimes kind of given away now because – we don't, we're not, we're not for sure, for sure if it hit at that armpit um, area. Now, I think Grealish, I've seen this given before. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, and I think had it been given, it would have been hard for Man City to feel any other way. Um, but I think they, I think they got away with it a little bit, but I understand why it wasn't called. Then you had last night in Cali Classico as a part of the three goal avalanche in the first half. You had, Basically, yeah, I got to be honest, I turned the game off after 4 1. Because, yeah, we're good. And then that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Always, look, when we were talking about it on Thursday, we had the, the tote, we said play the over at at least three and a half. And yeah. that, if not four, <laughs> it ended up at seven. I'll get that number. Yep. But in that three goal avalanche at the beginning in the first 30 minutes, you had a, uh, it was a free kick by Paintsel, I believe, uh, near the, uh, few yards away from the near side corner flag he sends it into the wall and you end up with the defender with a chicken wing situation yeah. and they call the chicken wing and they said yeah that's that's a that's a penalty yeah i think again there were, it seemed to be there was motion um involved with this not just he was standing there you know like i for example i had a girl friday night um now grand this is u13 so we're giving her some leniency but you know there was a kick taken and she put her hands in front of her face um, yes, there is motion, but we're not making our body bigger. And obviously you understand what you're doing by putting your hands in front of your face to not get hit in the face. Right. Yeah. But anything outside of your body this way is going to typically be scrutinized heavier. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of those where once that body goes outside your, your or arm goes outside of your natural body silhouette, if you're going to, especially through VAR, yeah. Now, now we're really t tuned into this, right? So now we can see did that move, did that move forward? Did it move out? Did it, you know, did it move up? What, what was the the motion that was involved with that? Okay, new uh, MLS uh, rules of engagement finally get engaged because we now have uh, our friends from the PSRA uh, attached to the situation, and I wanted to know what you thought about them, plus implementation and what you might have seen this past weekend off treatment rule allows medical professionals with time to assess and treat players off the field to play in a less pressurized environment. If a player with a suspected injury remains on the ground for more than 15 seconds, the referee will stop play, wave the medical crew onto the field to evaluate the player. When safe, the player will be removed from the field and remain off the field for a minimum of two minutes for further assessment and treatment. Then you have the time substitution rule. Maximizing effect, and this, this is words from Major League Soccer. Maximizing effective match time, the time substitution rule requires that a substituted player exit the field within 10 seconds. Failure to exit from any point on the field within the 10 seconds will cause the incoming player to wait for a 60 second holding period before entering the game at the next stoppage. During the holding period and prior to the substitute entering, the team will play down a player. Exceptions to the rule include injury and goalkeeper substitutions. You also had your in stadium VAR announcements that are attached to that as well. So we got them. We, they're, they're now a part of the match, and we had still stuff to talk about involving them. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I'll just say about all these is if you're counting personally all of these things, I think you're misunderstanding um, these rules, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, you're keeping track if you can as a referee, but, like, come on. You, you, they, these are supposed to be just ways to make people act a little bit quicker yeah. or give us a little bit better stipulation on when does a player need fit, you know, when, do, when do we actually call for um, medical assistance for players? Because how many times John, have you seen 
a player who somehow has been shot, wounded, left for dead, mm-hmm. and then five seconds later, just oh, we're still playing. We're yeah. we're going. You know, I mean, so that's kind of this like a good. Uh, for example, I had a, a game yesterday where um, a kid and his teammate ran into each other. Mm-hmm. and kid falls down it's not a head injury so i have no obligation to stop the match but yeah. you know i'm still got an eye on him and after about 10 seconds he's still down on the ground and we get to a point where i can actually stop play because we're not in active defending or attacking modes that's one of those times where you can go oh okay so he is actually <laughs> down on the ground um he is actually needing a, a medical assistance and so you know 15 seconds maybe that's some obligatory or um you know, some random number they chose or some, you know, maybe there was science behind it. I don't know how they landed on that, but I, that's just the threshold of like, oh, okay, they're actually hurt. So now let's bring them on. Um, I, I think that's actually okay. Now, the other one that we got into with this is, well, Miles Robinson was or was not hurt. Who knew? Yeah, I've got um, yeah, this one. I've got an issue with, but go ahead. No, I, I'd like to talk about it because I think in the referee's mindset, you're going, well, I I guess the the trainer came out onto the field. So at that point, the ref can't go, well, they came out for this guy and didn't attend him at all. It, it's it's a little different, right? Yeah. I understand also why Cincinnati felt um, upset about it because, well, Miles didn't receive treatment. Um, uh, what's his face did? Um, Holland, or not Hagman, Hagman. sorry. Yeah. Um, did. You know, so I, I understand. And that's that's a growing pain of these, I do think, because the referee said, well, the trainer came out, you were hurt. He was hurt. The trainer came out on the field. What are we talking about here? Um, I I think these are one of those where if you go back and I know everyone wants the referees to be perfect all the time, but this is just one of those good uh, learning tools of like, well, no, we, we, we can, we need to be a little bit more uh, aware of who actually received treatment and who didn't. Where miles was concerned. Hagland had the injury. When you go back and look at it, I initially thought that it was some kind of head-to-head contact between right. Miles, Miles and Nick Haglin. Then you go back and look at the replay, and Miles is a good foot away from Nick Haglin, grabs his head, and goes to the turf. But Exactly. We thought he could have been injured. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. For me in this case, A, if it is simulation – which it, it the the evidence is leaning toward that if you look at it from the television cameras i would have you know and this is once again not knowing what var can and cannot do uh, if var could recommend if that's i don't think it's reviewable but if var in a situation like that could recommend a card for simulation uh i would have given it i also have an issue with miles where he is feigning a head injury allegedly And in this current day and age where we are putting such a premium on paying attention to head injuries for Miles to apparently fake a head injury and go down to try and slow down momentum, I I really raised the people's eyebrow on that one with Miles because literally he was not close to Nick Haglund, grabs his head and goes down. And and again, that's why the referee said well what are you talking about you were injured the the trainer came onto the field you need to go off um because if i'm looking at that when i saw it live i thought oh same as you john oh he got he got hit in the head or something um so i'm i'm with you 100 percent. i think this was i don't i i understand again this is a learning tool so that referees because you can still learn from this and go okay let's make sure we see who gets treatment and who doesn't but at the same time Miles looked like he was hurt Mm. and went down apparently with a head injury. And Mm -hmm. uh, like those, we we do have the authority to stop the game for a head injury. Mm So I'm with you. Uh, Yeah. So, and, but for me, it legit. You know what it was, John? Mm. I, I, it was the turf. Yes. The turf impacted his head. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he's playing at Cincinnati, right? Because turf. Yes. Turf is somehow evil. Mm, yeah turf is incredibly evil as, as the thing but yeah it was uh yeah i and uh i'm apparently i'm not the only one here in the the uh the twitch pitch hutch and michael valverde they were not fans of what miles did 
uh, and the appearance of what Miles did. So let's, like I said, unless unless you ask Miles and Miles comes clean and sits and goes, yeah, it's it's what he apparently did. We have to we have to put that qualifier. But it is not a good look for Miles to be detached from an injury, go down with a head injury these days. As we're looking at you know making sure that everybody is is okay as you can be at the head. So yeah, I have I raised the people's eyebrow on that one when Miles went down. Um, well, as I have said multiple times when it comes to the U.S. men's national team, we no longer have to support or defend Miles Robinson. He is no longer our problem. There you go. Uh, the other incident that I wanted to uh, get in uh, your discussions with has to do with, once again, VAR. And, you know, this is why we have it. And this this particular play that, that drew the ire of a lot of folks, but it also let everybody know that, you know, VAR is VAR. And if you've got a problem with VAR, you probably need to sit there and change the rule that is associated with the particular play that you are reviewing. And it has to do with the seventh goal that wasn't the seventh goal in the Coventry City Manchester United match, where it was uh, by the millimeterist of millimeters that apparently Victor Torp was offside. Uh, or the Haji Wright was offside before he sets up Victor Torp for the for goal number seven, which would have completed uh, everything for Coventry City coming down three nil, coming back to <laughs> four three. So I think once again the larger issue here is if you got a problem with VAR, you've got to take a step back and address right. the offside rule first and foremost before you sit there. Because I heard more people from the other side of the Atlantic, from the old country. For some of us sit there and go, well, I've got a problem with VAR. No, your problem should be with the offside rule as opposed to VAR because VAR is doing its job and using Cyclops and whatever. Yes, uh, Haji Wright was offside by whatever margin. Like, you know, if he's a size 13, he probably needed to be a size nine or whatever in his boot. But I think the larger issue, once again, and when we have uh, folks who used to play and go back in my day, focus on the rule change instead of on the equipment that is used to yeah. enforce the rule. Well, I think if we want to talk VAR, you can you can have legitimate critiques of using lines to draw the offside line. Um, you know, again, those are human placed and drawn. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also assuming that we got it at the correct time where the ball left the foot of the player, you know. Yeah. But I'm with you, John. Like, that's the, that's the method we've been told to use. Um, and if you didn't use that, then you would still get people complaining because, you know, we have that in MLS where we do not have the lines. Nope. Um, we just look at it from the naked eye. And now I personally think that is a better way to look at it because I think if you start getting into lines and – I think you're misunderstanding the, the the nature of this sport, but but yeah, offside is offside, ball out is ball out, ball mm -hmm. in is ball in, a goal is a goal, right? Mm -hmm. they, there are very few definitive and placeable, really, you know, instances in this game, and offside is one of them. So um, now that said, yes, the real crime here is Haji Wright not getting an assist to lead Coventry to, you know, uh, FA Cup glory. And um, <laughs> that part I hate for him because I, I, from the soccer for us angle, Haji Wright's having himself a fantastic tournament um, and a fantastic season. And uh, I think that the real crime is not giving Haji Wright his assist that he, he deserved. Uh-huh. So, of course, uh, you saying that, and I wanted to try and, and let, I wanted to, I wanted to have you as a bit of a handoff here. And your timing was impeccable because it's 1030 or 1040. And guess who's here? It's Drew. And Drew, uh, <laughs> Drew heard the, the Haji Wright discussion. Uh, for the record, by the way, Drew was, how do we say this? Uh, he, he was venting a lot from from being up 3-0 to being tied at 3 to almost losing it at 4-3 to winning it in penalties. Uh, there were a lot of colorful metaphors that Drew was using in, in the conversations that we were having 
uh, about this particular match. And so uh, as a part of the handoff, Bart, do you have a question for Drew so you can listen to the rest of the show? No, because as a, as a fan of a team that recently got knocked out of a cup tournament and um, is desperately trying to not choke away a league title, um, I'm going to keep my karma Hopefully, uh-huh. at least in a little bit in the positive column. But I will say again, how'd you write robbed of an assist? There you go. Uh, so, Bart, uh, as we let uh, Drew gather his thoughts, how, what's the promo? What's going on with soccer for USPOD? I know that you guys are probably going to talk about Serginio Dest and a bunch of other things. Yeah, <laughs> so that'll be the topic of conversation is evaluating Twyla's career uh, or tenure as the um, associate assistant Um the substitute teacher. Substitute. The associate assistant substitute. Yes. And then also now Sergino Dess being out, gone for, we don't really know how long yet. PSV no. was not clear, but just definitely set an extended time. Now that, I'm hopeful that that just means like the rest of the season. Yeah. And that's what that's what Dess said so. on his Insta, at Soccer for USP, <laughs> yeah. Artemis Prime 19. As always, my friend, thanks for hanging out. And uh, I'm glad the real world intervened and said, no, you can be here at 10 o'clock in your normal time slot. So just yell at us when you need us. We'll be here soon. Cheers, y'all.